you have your Bible, open them up and turn to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. I uh, really have been, this is such a uh, thrill for me to be able to preach during this season. I will never take it for granted again after not being able to two years ago. Um, you know, there's some things that uh, we just uh, never expected we would do, but I'm grateful that, uh, and, and I, I want to say it that way, I'm grateful that we as God's people could come together and we could uh, uh, worship together to get today, that we could see uh, someone follow the Lord in baptism. And we've been in this series talking about the gospel, and the gospel is good news. That's what the word means. The word gospel means good news. And I'm grateful that the gospel still works. I'm, I'm grateful that people can still turn from their sins and accept Jesus Christ in their heart. The, the gospel is the most powerful thing in all the world. For some of us, it's been 50 years for me this spring. It's been 50 years since I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. If you're not too careful, you'll take the great gifts of God for granted. You'll just say, well, that's just a normal thing. Yes, I've accepted Christ. It's a normal thing. Let me go on and live my life. God wants more for us. That's the reason why Jesus came. He wants us to be filled with all the goodness of God. He wants us to have all the joys of love and peace and satisfaction. I like that word satisfied. And I am satisfied in Jesus. I mean, if you try things of the world, if you want to see how they work, you know, you might try it for a little time, but you might not be satisfied with it. You might find out that it just kind of comes up short. But Jesus has never come up short for me. Jesus has always satisfied my soul. The gospel is good news. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Colossae, there were some things that had been going on that, that he had to deal with. Earlier, in the book of Acts chapter 15, it talks about how some people, after uh, Christianity began, the, the old Jews tried to come in and tell, okay, it's okay to accept Jesus. They were Christians. But they said, we, we have to also make you Jews. So you have to follow the things of Christ, but you actually have to do all the things of the Jews and the law and all of that stuff as well. And they dealt with that. You didn't have to be circumcised. You didn't have to go through those, those rituals that were the outward rituals. That Christianity is what happens on the inside. And we grow from the inside out, not from the outside doing all the rituals in. Now that kind of snuck into the church at Colossae. They, they, they began to think, not that you had to to become a Jew, to become a Christian. Not, that's, they, they had grown beyond that. But they thought you had to follow all the rituals of Judaism. You had to be circumcised. You had to follow all the feasts and the festivals. You had, you had to, to literally follow the diet of Judaism and everything that came with it. And, and basically, they were doing an end run they didn't say you had to become a Jew to become a, a Christian, but they were saying now that you are a Christian, you've got to become a Jew to grow. Which once again takes away from Jesus Christ. It takes away from the work of Christ. The complete work that happened on the cross of Calvary that we're celebrating this week, Passion Week. So in Colossians chapter 2, Begin with me in verse number one. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture. You don't have to stand with me. I'm just going to kind of uh, talk as we go through this. Look in verse one. I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. He was disturbed because they were having to go through this. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, I haven't been there to help you and teach you. It's bothering me that you're going through this. But I want to, he says in verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged. Y'all like encouragement? Isn't it nice to know every now and again that you're on the right path and somebody will come behind you and say, hey, you're doing a good job. You're on the right path. Keep doing what you're doing. There may be somebody out there that's telling you you need to do something different. Don't worry about that. You're doing a good thing. So he says, uh, of which I became a, oh, excuse me, verse 2, in that many hearts, 
their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love. This is what I want you to get from God. I want you to, to have this bond of being together in the love that God has, attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. I don't know in our world today that we see so much that is valued by money that we really understand that there are things that bring us riches beyond money. Money will be here one day and gone the next. We had a conflict uh, with Russia not too long ago, or, you know, it's still going on, but when it first began and all the sanctions that came upon that country, the ruble went from like 90 per dollar to less than one-third of a cent. All that they valued was there, and then it was gone, and then it was there, and then it's down, and, and it's just like this. If you think of the value of what you have in God as being, well, I have a good day, I don't know I've got a bad day. I, I, I think I'm living pretty good. Man, I messed up. You're going to go into to a, a a psychotic trance of back and forth of depression and, and glory and, and feeling uh, down and feeling it's not a roller coaster. It's a, it's a steady life of living with Christ, trusting in Christ, listen, learning of Christ, letting Him develop you, letting Him bring forward great things in your life. He said, I want you to have, uh, I want you to understand all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. It, we, we have the Father as well as Jesus. We didn't miss out on anything. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But when you have Jesus, you have access into all the goodness of God. He says in verse 3, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You're not lacking anything. The world will say you've, you're, you, you're missing out. You're not. You've got it all. Look in verse 4. He says, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. They're going to come and they're going to try to talk you into their way of thinking than in following God's path. My goodness, this is happening. And that's the way the world goes. I don't blame them. They're, they're living in darkness. They don't know the light. They don't know the goodness of God. And they're very assured that, that the path that they have is the right path. And it, it, it's leading to, to hurt and pain. I, I was watching something not too long ago, and a person who had been married five times was given marriage advice. Well, they probably had learned every mistake you can make, right? But wouldn't it be better if you had a, a wisdom and an understanding and a knowledge before all the pain and the heartache and the brokenness and disregarding this one and, well, I'll try this one on for a while. Nope, that didn't fit. I'll try this one on for a while. And, and living their life that way, and they do it with everything. The world is bombarding us with commercials, the world is bombarding us with thought life. They're thinking. And, and by the way, I don't know, but I believe I have never seen a time in my lifetime for sure where there's been so much, if you do not agree with me, you're wrong, I'm right, and you've got to be defeated. That's the way the world believes. Not only do they say your thinking is wrong, but you have to stop your thinking. He says to the church at Colossae, I understand that they have theories. I understand that they have words. Listen now, they're persuasive words. Matter of fact, if you're not careful, they'll talk you back into darkness. If you're not careful, they will put you in a path that will lead you off a cliff without a parachute. And they'll blame you for falling off the cliff. That is the life of the world. And it sounds so good. You know, 
when I was a kid. I don't see them anymore, but when I was a kid, you, you go in on, a, on somebody's dining room table, they would have a, a bowl of all this beautiful fruit. Y'all remember that? And it looked just so good and so wonderful. But if you, if you reached out to grab a hold of it, I mean, there may be this wonderful, just shining apple, and you want to, I believe I'll have one of those. That's why they're on the table, right? So they eat them, and you pick it up, and it's plastic. Y'all, know, y'all remember what I'm talking about? There are so many people that are chasing that type of desire uh, or, or fulfilling that type of desire, but it's just fraud and fake. Look in verse number 8. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Cheat means I'm going to take away. Cheat means I'm going to do the wrong thing and I'm going to take the value of what you have. And they're going to do that, it says, through philosophy. There's a lot of philosophies out there. I, I, I think that uh, it's amazing to me. What about, I guess I may be wrong here. Some of you may can help me. When I was a, a kid, there was a guy by the name of Phil Donahue who had a talk show. I'm not sure he was the first. There were others that had variety shows and There were those that would interview people. But this one, they would talk about subjects and they would get the crowds involved. They would get the audience involved. And and they would be talking about this subject and and they would put a microphone in their hand. Right? Now, for a preacher, the most most absolutely frightening thing that can ever happen is somebody comes in that you don't know and they put a microphone in their hand. I don't know what's going to come out of their mouth, right? Right? And I'm back there going, right? A little bit of a control freak that I am. But they would put a microphone in their hand and they would get out there and they would just, they would just speak this babble. Now, they might be right on and they might be just as wrong as wrong can be, but they were never in doubt. They had all the wisdom of the world. By the way, we're all that way. We're all that way. I remember back in the days of seminary when we would sit around on the couches uh, in between classes, and, and I wished I'd record those conversations because we solved all the world's problems right there on the couches, right out there. I just forgot what the questions were. You know, I guess I could learn them again. I could go to the barber shop and learn all those things all over again because they solve all the problems in the world. If I didn't find them at the barber shop, I could go to the to the restaurant in the morning, and there's a group of guys that sit together and drink coffee. Have y'all seen them? And they know all the answers to all the problems of life. All the philosophies that are there. And they'll begin with these words. Well, I think. When I was a child, I was grateful that people didn't go by my philosophy. I'm grateful that they didn't go by what I thought. I'm grateful that I had someone to help me, to teach me, to encourage me, to mentor me, because I may have been in the second grade and thought I knew everything, but there are people who have very persuasive ideas and thoughts, and if you're not careful, you will follow them. He says here, they will come and cheat you through philosophies, I like this, empty deceit. Actually, I don't like that. But it's very graphic, isn't it? It says, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. It's almost like someone who looked at our world today wrote that down. It's looked like someone came today and Jesus said, I've got a fresh word. Don't believe all these philosophies, these, this empty deceit that's out there. All the traditions of, of the ways of the world, they, they think they've got it all figured out. Don't listen, don't fall into that trap. But rather stick to the stuff of knowing Christ. Verse number nine. For in him, that is in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of, of the Godhead bodily. He came in the flesh, but he didn't lose 
the deity of God. Everything that is of God, all the love of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the understanding and how the, the, the ways of this world go, all of the understanding. Look, this is not a science book. When it, when it speaks on sp- science, it speaks correctly. Amen? It's not a history book, but when it speaks on history, it speaks correctly. It's not a philosophy book, but when it speaks on philosophy, it speaks without error. This is not a book on romance, but when it talks about love, it tells you the truth of what love is and what love is not. You don't have to listen to this person on this talk show or this person who wrote this article in the newspaper or online or this group of people that have all this following of people and and what they're saying is trending on social media. God says, don't have to do that. I've got something for you. It's Christ. Everything that is of the goodness of God. And by the way, here's where I'm going. If you are in Christ, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, if you have as repented of your sins, believed in Him, trusted in Him, ask Him to save you because of what He did on the cross of Calvary, believing that He is dead, that he died on the cross for you, that he was buried, and that he rose again. If you have Christ, then you, look in verse 10, you are complete in him. You don't need anything else. You're complete. Your salvation is taken care of. Y'all look up here at me. Salvation is not a destination. Salvation is the Spirit of God living within you. And we live it in this world. So salvation is as we live in this world, we are complete in Him. And we have all the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We have the love of God and we need it in this world. We have the understanding. I I know that there will be times that you will be confused. I know that there will be times that you're not going to have it all figured out. I know that you're going to feel broken. I know that you're going to feel depressed. I know that you're going to have heartburn within you. But the answer is within you. Now, if you had not gone through all those hardships and difficulties and trials, then you would have not known the question. You would have had the answer, but you would not have known how to apply the answer. So I would have had love, but unless I went through an unlovely world, I would not have seen the comparison to the love that comes from God. I could have bought into the love of the world and got married five, six, twelve times. Praise God, I didn't need that. I got one Jesus, and I got one Lynn. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. Don't need to. Don't need another philosophy. Don't need another Savior. Don't need to add anything to Christ. Don't need to take anything away from that. Look here, it says, You are complete in Him who is the head. Who's the head? You can say Christ. You can say Jesus. Come on. Who's the head? Who's the one that's sitting on the right hand of the Father? Who is the one that sent the Holy Spirit that lives within us? Christ, who is the head of all principalities, that means all rulers and all power. Why should you look for anything else when you've got everything you need? In verse 11, this is where they're headed. He says, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It's not the outward thing, the surgery on the outward. It's the surgery the Holy Spirit does on the inward. The Holy Spirit is there to show you sin and tell you not to go towards sin, but to move away from sin towards God. By putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ, it's not just simply the outward circumcision. Christ helps us cut off daily our desire for sin. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism. What Emily did this morning represents what Christ did for us. 
Christ died for us, was buried under the water. And praise God, next Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday morning, is the day that we celebrate I, didn't, I thought she was going to keep Emily under the water there for a minute. <laughs> Raised to walk in newness of life. We are living, come on now, resurrection. It's not just a resurrection Jesus did all those years ago. We're living resurrection every day. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, what's the next part? Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I but it's Christ who lives in me, right? And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, who loved me, and gave himself for me. Baptism shows. It is, it is an identifying with him. That's what I did. It is a symbol of joining Christ, being a follower of Christ. He died for us. He was buried, and he rose again. We join him. We die to the, the things of this world. We, we let that die and bury it. But we're raised to walk in newness of life. Newness of life. Following him. Joining him. He says we're buried with him in baptism. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. Who raised him from the dead. Verse 13. And you being dead in trespasses. That's where we were. And the, and the uncircumcision of the flesh, that's where they were. He has made alive together with him. Having forgiven you, what's it say? All trespasses. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, you were dead in your trespasses, your sins, but you've been forgiven. He said, you were um, forgiven of all your trespasses, having wiped away the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Remember what I said? They, was, they thought that they were growing by, taking, by, by all those outward things, when the growing happens from the inside out. I like the end of verse 14. I want you to look at this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, by the way. But don't miss this. And when he has taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. So I was a sinner. Hold on. He nailed those sins to the cross. I was a failure. Hold on. That was taken and nailed to the cross. My insecurities, gone. You have Christ now, nailed to the cross. My troubles, my habits, forgiven, taken away, nailed to the cross. Trying to live up for it. No, you don't have to do that. It was done on the cross. Every need that you have was fulfilled in Christ. Every problem you had was nailed to the cross. The sufficiency. He took our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He who never made a mistake took all those burdens on Him. If he bore those things, if they've been nailed to the cross, you're no longer responsible for that. So when Christ sees you, he sees you as perfect and complete. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. He loves you completely right now. He knows you're going to make a mistake before you make it and loves you anyway. So instead of trying to please him, just accept him. And try to just put a smile on his face by seeing your heart that's open and in love with him. That's all he wants. 
all the requirements have been taken care of. When you get to heaven, what are you going to take with you? That's right. I mean, we're going to leave it all behind. Amen? All the things that so many people value, that they're holding on to, that they're hoarding, that they're trying to keep, I can't lose that. It's gone. When you go to heaven, what are you taking with you? A saved, cleansed spirit. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Whole and complete in Him. You wouldn't be there unless it had already been provided. So we need to start living in that vein. Every day you're a child of God. Every day you are loving complete. Every day we're growing. I promise you the growth in Christ will unbelievably accelerate if we can just accept the gift of our wonderful Savior. <clears throat> Verse number 15. Jesus, he has disarmed the principalities, the rulers and the powers. He's taken over them and he's made a public spectacle of them. When we get to heaven, all the wisdom of this world, we will laugh at. All the things that we valued, we're going to say, we thought so much of that? All the things that we thought that we couldn't do without. Mm -mm. Look at the end of verse 15. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. This word, triumph. Everyone that Paul was writing to understood this. But us in our society, we, we have no idea what that means. In that day when a king or a general representing the king went to war, when they won the war, they would come back home. And when they got to the capital city, they didn't just go to their barracks. They would enter the city with the entire city coming out, and there would be a parade of sorts and all the celebration and the king would come and or the general there and they would come rolling up in the in the chariot and all, all the all the people cheering them on and tied to the back of the chariot was the conquered king or general they were defeated but they were tied up having to walk behind it so everyone could see that they had won and the other was defeated. And it was a time of celebration. It was a time of victory. If they knew the song back then, they would have been shouting, Victory in Jesus! When Jesus, 40 days after the resurrection, raised His hands and ascended back to glory. There was a triumph there. He entered heaven, and all of heaven celebrated with him. But the ones that he conquered were not walking behind him. They had been defeated by the blood of the Lamb. And he went to the, to the throne where the mercy seat was. And he took the blood, the blood that cleansed me, and if you're saved, the blood that cleansed you, and put it there on the mercy seat at the throne. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father, symbolizing that the job is done. That's what he said on the cross. It is finished. We live today in triumph. He is triumphing as he walks through this day. And we are there with him. We do not need Christians walking as defeated. We do not need Christians acting as if they've got to do something else to please God. You are complete 
in him. You lack nothing. And if you're celebrating, then celebrate in the dark world because they need to see the light of Christ. They need to know that there's hope. They need to, they don't need to see you as an, well, I hope so, I maybe so, I don't know. That's teaching them that there is no certainty in Christ. So maybe you feel bad one day. Me too. Maybe you don't feel like getting up and putting on a face. You think it would look fake. Been there. So what do you do? You have a little talk with Jesus. You get in his word and let him speak his truths to you again. And you pour out your heart and you let the Lord do an amazing work within you. We only have to get baptized one time. But I've been anointed a hundred times. Probably over a thousand times. I don't have to get saved all over again. But I have to remember the power of my salvation. Every now and again, we just need to have a, we need to preach ourselves our own sermon. We just need to let the Lord whisper into our hearts, I love you. I love you. Look around. The world needs this message. They need to see it in you. They need to hear the love of God, full and complete.